taking notes and that was a Thursday <laughs> and um, now two days after um, he recorded that he took um, some members of that band on the road for a four month tour and uh, early on um, they hit Hagerstown in Maryland and they were greeted by the promoter uh, who insisted that they play at um, uh, a white dance um, before they played at the colour dance they were booked to play at and uh, and uh, he said they wouldn't be paid for that. So uh, anyway, they reached a compromise because uh, General Morton produced two pistols. <laughs> so they ended up playing both dances and got paid for both of them. Uh, of course, I'm carrying two pistols on me at the moment, which I'm running, I'm running such a tight band. That's why they sound so marvellous. And uh, yes, they're very well behaved. Now, um, an another large uh, aggregation was recorded by Morton that, um, a year later, and uh, they recorded this rather nice tune called Try Me Out, and I like this because it reminds me of those lovely tunes that you hear on the Laurel and Hardy films, it's got that kind of vibe to it, and uh, jazz musicians uh, to a man, all great Laurel and Hardy fans. Uh, Menno Darms is an expert, yeah, he, uh, he actually recorded in the Bohunks Orchestra in, uh, in uh, Holland, and, uh, and it created all these wonderful old Laurel and Hardy tunes. Anyway, I'm rambling now. So this is called Try Me Out.
much. Uh, and on that number, you had uh, solos from uh, Duke Heiker there on the trumpet. And uh, his cohort in the reed section is Jean-Francois Bonnel. Now, uh, here's a number uh, recorded from the same session as our opening number, a Red Hot Pepper Stomp, and uh, this is probably one of Joe Rommel's masterpieces. It's uh, a beautiful blues uh, called Deep Creek, and there's some um, speculation whether there was an organ playing in the background of this number. It's, it's very hard to tell, because uh, there are lots of stained chords from the band, but there was an organ in the studio in Camden, New Jersey. So. Uh, you know, get your 78 out and have a listen and uh, tell me what you think. So here we go, deep print blue.
way here, especially to play that number, so thank you for that, Rob. And uh, the lovely wailing clarinet chorus from Jean-Francois there. <laughs> Chaps about uh, a concert I once did at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, and uh, the late Randy Colville played that solo. And uh, of course, Randy was well known as uh, being a kind of a Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw clarinet player. And uh, you know, to him, that was he couldn't understand that solo at all. And after he played it, he stood up and said to the audience, "Well, that's what it says here." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is another uh, entitled Gambling Jack, who was probably one of those seedy characters that um, General Walton rubbed shoulders with, because uh, he had a somewhat checkered career, you know, he was, uh, he was in and out all kinds of rackets, um, he was a racehorse owner, a boxing uh, promoter, uh, he sold quack medicines, um, and he was an expert pool player. I'm, I'm sure you know, and uh, he once rubbed along with a chap called Har Harry Dunn, who taught him to cheat at a game called Georgia Skin, and uh, he didn't teach him quite well enough, and uh, one evening uh, they got rumbled uh, by somebody that they were trying to dupe who pulled a gun on them, and uh, you know, they had to kind of leg it. Uh, uh, so, and Jelly Roll once said, you know, was, uh, later reflecting about his career, he said, it's just a shame some of those environments I just wandered into. <laughs> so this, this is Gambling Jack, and, uh, and thanks to Keith Nichols for this arrangement.
this is a, a number from late in General Morton's career, because it's around about 1940, I think, uh, with his six, General Morton's six. So we're going to give a couple of the guys uh, a rest on this number. I think Martin and uh, Graham. And uh, we have uh, a surprise guest for you, because uh, General Morton uh, worked with a few co-vocalists uh, in his time, uh, the best known being Lizzie Miles. Um, uh, the others, Francis Hereford and Edmonia Henderson, uh, as well known, and Billy Young, he did a couple of sides with. Billy Young was his secretary in his New York office. And uh, uh, she was the victim of uh, when a guy tried to put a voodoo curse on the and sprinkled powder around the office and uh, he put it in the water cooler. And uh, Jelly said that this girl's lips swelled up like bumpers on a boxcar. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> we have a pianist, uh, a, a singer now with uh, perfectly formed lips. And it is, of course, the lovely Janice Day, and she will be singing this number entitled Why. <laughs> I think I'm being rude. Anyway, um, I'll come in in a bit. One, two, one, two, Uh, Jean-Francois playing 
Beato in tune on the record. Beato plays terribly out of tune. So thanks for that. <laughs> now, um, here's a couple of uh, more tunes from 1930, and this thing's called uh, Crazy Chords. Of course, there was a vogue in the 20s for tunes with um, odd harmonies, and uh, Big Spy Beck wrote quite a few of them, Candlelights in the Dark, and um, Andy Schumann and I would be playing uh, a duet version of um, In a Mist on the famous duos um, uh, session uh, later this weekend. Um, but this is Morton's idea of crazy chords, which um, did sound rather quaint by 1930, it must be admitted, but it's uh, quite a charming tune. Uh, one, two. Thank you. 
oil well. Now, uh, Jerome Morton, um, his roots went back to Scott Joplin. Um, uh, Scott Joplin was a great influence on him. Uh, his interest now, their careers are almost parallel, like 20 years apart. Um, Joplin's father wanted him to, you know, have a proper job going to a trade, and uh, he wanted to be a pianist and composer, so he left home and uh, sort of wandered around the Mississippi states as an itinerant pianist and playing in brothels and tent shows and uh, exactly the sort of thing that Morton did uh, about 20 years later. Uh, and of course, uh, Morton knew all of Joplin's rags on the Library of Congress recordings. Uh, he said that, uh, um, you know, when he went to St. Louis and uh, they, they wanted him to play all these things and he said, and I knew them all. Yeah. Uh, so this is my arrangement of uh, Joplin's elite syncopations, so, so a departure from the Morton canon here. Uh, there might be a few sort of little jelly touches here and there. And uh, this is a number that comes from the same year as um, Joplin's famous Entertainer, 1902.
to another real Morton classic, and uh, this is his Smokehouse Blues, one of the real classic uh, Red Hot Pepper numbers. And uh, this started life actually it wasn't written by Morton, it was written by a chap called Charles Luke, who entitled it Creole. And uh, you can hear a recording of it by Ross Reynolds in his orchestra in 1924. And it's nothing as good as General Morton's recording. In fact, it makes you realise um, the extent of Morton's genius, how he turned this thing into an absolute masterpiece. And uh, I love the atmosphere of this piece. It's, uh, you can feel the sort of uh, balmy uh, New Orleans afternoons. Yeah. Sort of balmy afternoon in Whitby Bay. <laughs> <laughs>
flutes. Uh, number he never recorded with his band. Um, he recorded uh, uh, with John and Baby Dolls as a trio, um, as a duo with a uh, very fine clarinet player called Voltaire Defoe, but uh, never with his band. So I'm trying to just kind of imagine what he might do with it. Um, so I hope you like this. And uh, this is one of Morton's um, very earliest numbers. Uh, the guitarist Jonathan Sierra comes in playing it in New Orleans as far back as 1906. And uh, Morton always called it the Wolverines. It was never a blues. And it, it became a blues when the Spikes Brothers um, got their names on it. They wrote some lyrics. They intercepted the letter um, where the Melrose um, uh, Music Corporation had offered Morton a $3,000 advance on the tune. I thought, oh, well, I'll have some of this. So they, uh, they broke themselves in like it, and the next thing you knew, it was published uh, with the Spikes Brothers. It's Spikes, Morton, Spikes, and they wrote that lyrics, and it became Wolverine Blues. And he, he referred to them as a couple of corn fed musicians. <laughs> anyway, no corn fed musicians on this set. We've got Graham Hughes on the drum line. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 